بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد أيها الحبيب في الله continuing on in our study of شرح السنة by Imam Bahari رحمة الله عليه he said رحمه الله تعالى that من كان من أهل الإسلام فلا تشهد فلا تشهد له بعمل خير ولا شر فإنك لا تدري بما يختم الله له عند الموت ترجله رحمة وتخاف عليه ذنوبه من ذنب إلا وللعبد منه توبة إمام بارباري رحمة الله رحمة الله عليه he said and do not bear witness uh, for any of the people of Islam, meaning that he is a person of paradise or a person of the hellfire, due to good or a bad deed, since you do not know what his final action uh, was before his death. Uh, you hope for Allah's mercy for him, and you fear for him because of his sins. You do not know what has been destined for him at the time of his death as regards repentance and what Allah has destined for that time if he dies upon Islam. You hope for Allah's mercy for him and you fear for him because of his sins. Imam Baba Hari mentioned something very important. Although there is some difference with some ulama, but the most correct in accordance with many of our ulama, which they say is the, the call and statement of Imam Baba Hari is that Ahl Sunnah, we do not, uh, the Muslim, does not uh, bear witness that someone is in paradise or hellfire. For example, we love many of our scholars and our scholars who have passed on or people who are righteous, people that you knew that were Muslim, that were very nice people or gave a lot of charity and tzedakah. We can't say so-and-so is in Jannah or so-and-so is in the hellfire. So-and-so who who did a lot of sins but they died still as, as a Muslim, inshallah, we hope, uh, from what we know on the Zahir. Uh, the apparent uh, way of his life, but he was a major sinner, he always drank, he always went to the club, he always, he died committing adultery, whatever the situation was, uh, Ahl Sunnah, the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah is that we don't bear witness that they're in the hellfire or that they are in paradise because we don't know the state in which they died. Some examples, as there was controversy when Saddam Hussein was, was killed and others, because he took the Shahada before he died, but during his life he was known as a Hezbabath. And many of our great scholars, some of the major scholars, and from those I'll mention that I know for sure made takfir of him, were like Ben Baz, Rahmatullah and our Sheikh, Sheikh Mukbil bin Hadi, al Wadi, Allah uh, and, 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 and others. But those two for sure I know, they made takfir, and it's written, it's in, uh, you can listen to it on tapes, and you can read it. And with regards to that, there was a lot of controversy because his last goal was, as the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever dies, a bearing witness that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is his last uh, messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then he will enter paradise. So due to that, a lot of people, uh, there was a lot of confusion. Some people saying, Saddam Hussein, you know, that he's in Jannah or or that he uh, you know he died a Muslim and stuff and others some scholars said no because he had to distance himself from his principles of disbelief meaning that although he took that Shahada we don't know what's in his heart but he was known up until that point to be on uh, to be on the Baathist uh, ideology which is an ideology of pure kufr it, it, there's no room for if and so buts because they raised the love the party over the uh, even if they compared it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Sharia or what have you they raised their their party to the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if it is God and it's their their party and if their ideology is superior to the Lord Rabbil Alameen or his Sharia or his uh, his deen and to make it short and relevant to what we're discussing, Ahabitifillah, is that the shahid is, is we do not bear witness that someone is in the hellfire or paradise. So we can't say Saddam Hussein was in paradise. We can't say he's in, in the hellfire because we don't know the state of his heart. We don't know his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
with details. We don't know. We just heard him, his last words were the Shahada. And so we stop. And that's safest, and there's no benefit of you to speculate and go into details about so-and-so. I believe so-and-so was, so -so was a great scholar, and he did so many good deeds. You don't know on his deathbed what was in his heart. Was there hypocrisy? Was there something? We wish for them good. And as Imam Baba Hari said, uh, rahma, that you hope for him mercy. You hope for those persons who uh, die uh, as Muslims, you hope mercy upon them. You, 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 and you supplicate for them. And you, you're fearful of their sins and you hope that they made toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we cannot bear witness that someone is uh, in the uh, hellfire or that someone is in paradise. And uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed al Najmi, he mentioned some great benefits with regard to that and some textual nasus from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to uh, in in that regard. And uh, moving on, Ahabatifillah, we'll move on to the next point. And that is the statement of Imam Baba Hari Rahmatullah He said uh, which is relevant to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the repentance of all sins. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the, the, the repentance of the people of Ma'asi, the, people, the, the sinful person who repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mentioned on countless times the, uh, in order to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should uh, stop the sin. You should be determined to not return to the sin. Stop the sin determined to not return to it, and thirdly, that you uh, you feel sorrow and shame for the sin that you did, you know, and seek istighfar from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then that is an illustration of your intention, your niyyah. And the Prophet sallallahu said, in a bin niyyad, verily actions are tied to the intentions. So that is how you exhibit your intention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your intention, is by acting on true Islamic toba, which is comprised, as Imam Noah we said, of those three things. And with regards to what Imam Baba Hari said, Rahmatullah know that there's no, uh, he said, uh, there's no sin except that the servant may repent from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitabi al kareem inna Allah la yaghfiru wa yushrika bi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika li may yashat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitabi al kareem verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, doesn't forgive that you commit shirk. Doesn't forgive that you uh, uh, you associate partners with him. Polytheism. But he forgives other than that for whomsoever he pleases. Uh, we understand this ayat in the context of other verses, in the context of other nusus from the Prophet Sallallahu in that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, if you die upon shirk, if you die associating partners with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, on polytheism, worshipping other than Allah, worshipping along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala someone, your dead ancestors, your sheikh, your leader, your parents, uh, inhabitants of the grave, wh whoever, the Prophet sallam, the angels, rocks, stones, elephants, cows, whatever the case may be, Jesus alayhi salatu wasalam, that if you die upon that, you've died upon polytheism because then you've associated a partner with Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah doesn't accept forgiveness for that. However, Allah accepts that if you make toba while you're living, of course, if it's not uh, before it's too late. مَا لَمْ كَمَا قَالَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ As long as the, uh, you know, you're basically on your deathbed and the, the gargle of death, if you want to call it, uh, has it come to you? So if you've made toba before that time, the, the bab is open. If you've made repentance before that time, it's open for you. Or if one of the signs of the last day that the sun uh, rises in the uh, west, that uh, 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 that so if if this time comes, then it's too late to uh, make toba. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And this lets us know the importance of adhering to Kitab wa Sunnah 
and striving to purify our Tawheed by Iman, Iman Billah, and gaining uh, Islamic knowledge, sound Islamic knowledge. And with regards to that, Ahabatifillah, with regards to evidence that, of course, that if someone is uh, on shirk, the major shirk, and they become Muslim, okay, then of course that gets rid of their previous sins. And that gets rid of the shirk that they were upon. Or if someone was a Muslim, but then they apostated. And they began worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or with along, alongside with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they worship someone or something. But then they uh, came back and made tawbah. Of course, that will, they will be forgiven for that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amma alamta anna l-islama yahdamu ma kana qablahu when al hijrata tahdamu ma kana qablaha when al hajja yahdamu ma kana qablahu the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said he said this to uh, amr ibn as radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said uh, do you know that uh, don't you know that islam that it erases or expiates that which came before it, meaning disbelief. And that hijra, making the hijra for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the land of Muslims, uh, uh, from land of disbelief to the land of belief, the land of shirk to the land of tawheed, from the land of shirk to the land of tawheed, from the land of bid'ah to the land of, uh, of, of uh, sunnah, that this uh, expiates your sins as well the sins that came before it. So these are great deeds showing us that making hijrah, embracing Islam first and foremost, is one of the greatest things a person can do if they were on disbelief. Uh, making hijrah, one of the greatest deeds you can do as well. And hajj, of course, as well, as the Prophet Wasallam said. He said, it, And that hajj, it also expiates those sins that a person uh, committed before that. And so, very important, I have to fill out, is why the door of Tawbah is open to make Tawbah to Allah, make repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa Imam Babahari rahmatullahi alayhi qal, wa rajim haq, wa mas'al khufayn sunnah, wa taqseer salat fi safar sunnah, wa sun fi safar men shah sam, wa men shah iftar, wa la bas bi salati fi sarawil. Imam Baba Hari said that Rajam is haq, that stoning is the truth, that stoning, which is a, a, a sharia punishment, that it is it's, it's the truth, letting us know that the Salaf continued that sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, although we have people, yet people in the earlier times, and I was just listening to a benefit from one of the Mashaykh uh, in this very dars, and he was talking about... Uh, how the Mu'tazila and I think it was the Khawarij or it was a, one of the other early sects that they denied a rajim. They denied it. They and, you know some of the philosophers, of course, they denied it and said no, it is not. Uh, you know it's 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 from an abrogated verse in the Quran, uh, and so they were saying the hukum is abrogated, and so the ulama say with regards to the uh, ayah which has been uh, abrogated from the Quran but its hukum remains they say nusikhat tilawa or nusikhat tilawata al ayah nusikhta tilawa wa baqayt al hukman wa baqayt hukman so they say with regards to this verse is that the verse was um, it was abrogated and being read as a verse but the ruling remained and this is what Imam Barbahari is making ishara towards is that the ayat which was uh, comes mentioned in a hadith uh, 
ورد في سنن ابن ماجة في كتاب الحدود that is mentioned in uh, Sunan ibn Majah in the book of uh, Hadud or the punishment uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said a shaykh wa shaykha ida zaniya farjumuhuma bat al batta nakala min Allah wallahu alimun hakim where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the the uh, the sheikh and the sheikha, the elderly man and the elderly woman, or the, the man who has, uh, in, in relation to the hukum here, the man who, or woman who has been uh, married, uh, regardless if they're married at the time, the fact that they have, they're no longer virgins, they've been married, that if they commit adultery, that they are to be uh, stoned. And this is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah is the most wise and the all-knowing. So the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ practices, uh, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een practices the Khulafa Rashidin, and uh, the, the Salaf of this Ummah practice this hukum. So letting us know that this hukum, uh, that it still exists. And one thing that's very important with regards to this hukum as well, is that it's very rare, even throughout history, that it was uh, implemented that often because it's very difficult to establish that someone has committed adultery. One of the ways is that if they admit it, or if a woman becomes pregnant and she's not married, or if they, uh, or if they're witnessed by four witnesses. And how difficult is that for four people to witness that someone has actually entered? A man has entered a woman, you know, Akramakumallah, that they had relations. It's very difficult. Even if they saw Shuba, if they say, oh, I saw them, Akramakumallah, kissing, or I saw them this, that's not zina. So, in order to implement this, you know, it's a very difficult rule in showing you also kind of the mercy of the shara as well, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made it something that you can play with, unlike some of those brutal groups who just very easily. Uh, try to implement this hukum, this ruling, without the authority or without the uh, the mechanisms and the sharia truly implemented in order for them to do so. So this can be a very, very dangerous thing. And you hear about this, especially in a lot of uh, traditional societies where ignorance prevails and tribal law rules as well, that a lot of times they uh, do these uh, jealousy killings and these other implement these other uh, things which are not in accordance with the shara and sometimes they even do it in the name of the shara and commit these uh, these brutalities and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon the Muslims and guide us Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen Imam Baba Hari Rahmatullah he also said in the, in the next statement he said al Khufain Sunnah so that uh, wiping over the socks and I don't have socks on, or else I would illustrate, you know, the wiping over the socks, that you wipe over the top of the foot, uh, which is, uh, according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and I believe it's more than 70 Sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, narrated uh, uh, about, about this hukum, this ruling, uh, the rulings about uh, Masal Khufayn. And so the reason Imam Barbahari mentioned this in his book Shara Sunnah, which is predominantly creed based and Aqidah, is because this issue also it, it enters into fiqh, but it enters into creed as well. Why? Because there are groups from Ahl Bidah, like the uh, Khawarij. And here's what Imam. Uh, uh, Imam uh, Ahmed bin uh, Ahmed al Najmi mentioned, he said, "Mas al Khufain min al Sunan, wa qad adkhala mas al Khufain fil fil aqaid, لأن بعض المبتدعين أنكره وهم الخوارج والشيعة بحجة أنه لم يرد في القرآن." So Imam uh, Ahmed al Najmi rahmatullahi he said that the reason that this is this enters, this mas'ala, it enters not only into fiqh, but it enters into creed or aqidah, is because that uh, 
uh, some of the innovative sects, they denied it, like the Khawarij and the Shia. So if you know about the Shia, and you'll find they don't wipe over their socks. They believe you have to wash your feet. And uh, that, and their hujja, their dalil, what they use for evidence for not wiping, this is both the Khawarij and the Shia, is they say that uh, there's no dalil from the Quran for this. So this is why. But there are so much, as, as uh, Imam Ahmed al Najmi says, Rahmatullah وَهُوَ ثَابِتٌ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ فِي رُوَايَةِ الْجَمَاعَةِ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ So it's mentioned by many Sahaba. وَصَارَ أَنْكَرَهُ عِلْمٍ عَلَى أَهْلَ بِدْعَةِ وَأَهْلَ سُنَّةِ أَهْلَ سُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ يُثَبِّتُونَهُ لِوُجُودِ الدِّلَّ بِي So Ahlul Sunnah, they, uh, they affirm this practice because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned in many ahadith about wiping over the socks. Uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu was traveling and then he used the restroom and uh, uh, then he he um, he made wudu and he wiped over his khufain because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said you know do not take my khufs off فَإِنِّي أَدْخَلْتُهُمَا طَاهِرَتَيْنُ كَمَا قَالَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم For verily, I have entered them in a state of purity. So meaning that, of course, that's one of the shuruq, one of the conditions for wiping over your khufs or your socks, is that you were in a state of purification, tahara, when you entered them. Then you can wipe over them once you break your wudu, and you make a new wudu, you don't have to take them off. Instead, you can wipe over them, uh, and the tafsil for that, We'll say for the Durus in Fek, and you can go back to our lectures, and there's many lectures by many students of knowledge out there, uh, and the others that have been of, that have uh, mentioned the the full conditions for wiping over the socks. So this is why Imam Barbahari mentioned this in this book of Aqidah in Creed and Minhaj, is that it actually enters in the Bab of Aqaid as well because of those groups, some of Ahl Bid'ah who deny. Uh, wiping over the hoofs. Uh, another reason or another benefit that we can take from this is it also shows us how shaman that, uh, and we mentioned this in the beginning of this study, that uh, when Imam Barbahari, when those Imams of the Salaf, when they mention that uh, about uh, a sunnah, they mention sunnah, sunnah to them, it referred to all of Islam. So that includes aqidah, and uh, fiqh and fiqh mu'amalat, you know, or fiqh of ibadat. You know, it included all of Islam. That's why Imam Baba Hari said in the beginning of the treaties, Al Islam was Sunnah, was Sunnah to heal Islam. That Islam is a Sunnah, and Sunnah is Islam. And that you can't separate the, the two. Also, he said, Rahmatullah in that same uh, ibarah that we mentioned, he said, Taqsir uh, salat fi safar Sunnah. He said, also, that shortening the prayer while one is traveling is also from the sunnah. And that means, of course, in the general way, that you, of course, shorten prayers that are four rak'ah units to two rak'ah units. And this is pretty much known to the Muslims in general. Maybe a new Muslim might not be aware of that hukum. But this is uh, well known to the Muslims. So, for example, you might shorten dhuhr uh, you might shorten dhuhr, or you might shorten asa, you know, if there's a need to do so, if there's a, a, a sharia ruling for doing so. Uh, or isha, shortening it to two raka units, but you do not short, of course, shorten fajr. Fajr is a, a two unit uh, rakats, units of prayer, so you cannot shorten that. Uh, also, of course, you cannot shorten maghrib, which is three units. And this is something which is agreed upon by the uh, by the ulama and first and foremost the adilla comes from kitabillah qala subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitab al-kareem wa idha darabtum fi al-ard fa laysa alaykum junahun an taqsiru min salati an khiftum an yaftan an yaftanukum alladhina kafaru inna al-kafirina kanu kanu lakum adun mubin 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, uh, if you uh, travel throughout the earth, and then there's no harm uh, upon you if you shorten the prayer. If you are fear uh, in fear, uh, you know, of fitna from those people who disbelieve, verily the disbelievers are to you an open enemy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the, the, the Muslim a rukhsa, a, and, and, and a, um, the excuse and the made it permissible for him to shorten his prayer when he's traveling. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also used to shorten his prayer uh, when, uh, of course, if it was a fear prayer and also uh, that uh, while travel, traveling, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So those are some of the benefits. And Imam Barbahari mentioned that also in, in this book, Shara Sunnah, because again, the Sunnah covers all of that. It covers all, uh, all of Islam. The last uh, thing Imam Barbahari mentioned in this, uh, or the next to the last, he said, Wasom fi safar men sha son wa men sha aftar. So showing us that this is the madhab, uh, Ahmed, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi says, Fi madhab jamahir min ahl sunnati wal jama'ah an fatr, an al-fatr fi safar rukhsatun min Allah. That uh, when fasting, that it's permissible to break one's fast if they're traveling. And this is according to the madhab of the majority of the scholars of ahl sunnah. Uh, and that this is a something, a great blessing and ni'ma and ruksa or something that Allah has made permissible for the believer to make easy for him in practicing uh, the religion of Islam. So this is also an important aspect of uh, that Imam Barbahari mentioned that if there is, uh, uh, and the ulama differ about what is the level of, is it a, you know, uh, is it better to fast while someone uh, is traveling or not, even if they have no difficulty? So, 